Good morning. As the church gathers in this place today, I think it's important for us to turn our hearts and our minds towards Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the creator of the universe. He is so worthy of our focus and of our songs and our praise and our worship. Would you rise? Would you join me in a time of worship? Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, oh yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Good morning. You could be seated if you want. I don't think. Oh gosh, it's so excited to see happy people. Uh, yes, even if they're sometimes annoying. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't abuse my members. Just so that you know that those of you on the internet, I have a members that are abusive to me, and so <laughs> some of them are just annoyingly happy in the morning. Yes, and he's waving at me now. So, uh, I, but uh, uh, I've got good friends. Uh, I have a few. Uh, one. Um, so, uh, but it's it's good to see everybody here today. Um, 
You know, I don't think we ever focus on the words uh, of that last song often, especially the chorus, where, you know, we're singing it as a very jubilant nature. You give and take away. You give and take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, In Scripture, do you remember who said those words? Job. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And this is somebody that had experienced just a tremendous amount of pain and a tremendous amount of loss. But even though he experienced all of this loss, Job knew where all of it came from. It came from God. All of it. Everything we have came from God. And if we really understand it... and. and Please understand, I do not want you to think that I am de-emphasizing loss or I am de-emphasizing hurt. We can never forget that that this is the wonderful thing about the Bible. This is why I get very excited about the Bible. Part of it is because I'm a geek. I understand that. That's, That's fine. But the reason I get so excited about the Bible is because it is a whole it is all one piece because it has one author. And, and God, he, he, he tells us that, you know, he gives us these things. We understand that God gives us these things. We understand that he takes away things at times. We understand that there is tremendous loss. But do not forget, Jesus Christ said himself, I have come that you might have life, what? More abundantly. We as believers in Jesus Christ are going to be able to experience happiness beyond those on this world because we know what's waiting for us. We've read the end of the book. We're also going to be able to experience hurt more than anyone else because, see, we are unafraid of that which hurts. We don't want to experience it. We certainly don't want to lose children or or people or friends or family. We have no desire to do that because God created us for life. But Jesus Christ said, I have come that you might have life abundantly. Because we have read the end of the book. God gives everything that we have. He gives us our very life. He gives us... This, this world to enjoy. And, and Jesus, again, let me quote, you know, remind you that he says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The rain falls on those people that know me as Lord and Savior. The rain falls on people that do not know me as Lord and Savior. We call that common grace for those of us that you know, study theology all the time. But God gives everything. And he gives, and he does take away. This is a statement of the workings of this world. The sun rises, the sun sets. He gives and takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord, because he gives it all. Let's stand as we read together our scripture for today. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Father in heaven, may as we live our lives, may our lives be a blessing on those that come around us, on those that we meet, on those that we interact with. May we we be that, that bright spot in their day. Father, we do not ever want to be a type of a person that uh, 
sucks the joy out of people's lives. We want to be people, Father, that make others, that cause others want to know Jesus Christ better. That are made curious by how can we live life with such abandon? How can we act like, every, act like everything is so abundantly provided? How can we just rejoice in the simple things such as rain and sunshine? Even positive economy. How? Well, Father, may we live our lives in such a way that people want to know and they will come to know the fact that it's because of you. Now, Father, I ask that you would open our hearts today for those of us that are hurting and that are here. Father, would you begin the process of healing? Would you calm our hearts and minds? Would you give us that knowledge that knowing you is more than everything this world has to offer? Father, you open our hearts today, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace?
face that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. You may be seated. You can stay on your sofa. You know, uh, I just feel the need to talk to the, those of you on the internet on occasion, uh, because not because everybody is asleep here. I don't want you to feel that way. Um, but uh, you you don't know. <laughs> you only have me to give you the play by play analysis. Um, there, I just uh, this is a time we focus on our uh, on our giving. Uh, for those of you on the internet uh, that, are, that are watching, there are multiple ways of giving. You can give through the website. You can mail things to us. Uh, those of you that are here, you can put it in the boxes that are on the back walls, or you can drop it by the office. Uh, giving for the believer in Jesus Christ is an act of worship. It has always been an act of worship. And it really goes back to how everything, again, I just, I'm just i amazed at how Scripture is a whole, because everything's God's. And so we are just acknowledging through our giving that what we have ultimately belongs to God, but he only wants us to give what is proportionate. And so we give what we, you know, what he enables us to give. And some people can give a lot more than others. And, you know, that's perfectly fine because this is God's. And we want to make sure that he knows that we know it's all his. And that's why we give. And we give out, an, out of an act of love for him that loved us first. Father in heaven, you just bless those that give and support this church. Father, you have just incredibly protected us. You have supported us. Uh, Father, uh, the, the COVID pandemic, uh, it, it is truly, Father, a sign of your coming the way it has disrupted not just our country, but all of this world. Uh, your word tells us that as we get closer to the coming of your Son, that we will see such things increase and happen more frequently. Not just pandemics, Father, but also natural disasters. Uh, there is something called climate change, because indeed the, there is change in the climate. But it's not because of a scientific phenomena or because of something that man is doing. It's because that this world, as part of your creation, is crying out for your people to be ultimately redeemed. Just as Paul writes in Romans chapter 8. So Father, I ask that those of us that know you as our Lord and Savior, we will live with the knowledge that your word is truth. We can trust it and you're coming. And so, Father, in this time before that happens, we want to live our lives in such a way that we acknowledge that what we have is yours. And we thank you, Father, for giving us all that we do have, our homes, our lives, our health, every aspect of who we are. You have given it to us. So, Father, we thank you for this, and I ask you to bless those that give and you bless them abundantly so. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Finding myself At a loss for words And the funny thing is It's okay Last thing I need to be heard, but to hear 
what you say, word of God speak, which you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise, all that I need is to be with you and in the quiet. Hear your voice. You're in this place. Please let me stay in rest in your holiness. Word of God speak. Would you pour down my grain? Washing my eyes to see your majesty. Be still and know that you're in this place. The compound uh, sodium chloride is a necessary element in the maintenance of life on this planet. Uh, it's made up of two ions. Uh, I actually learned some of this stuff when I was in, in school. Um, uh, both sodium and, and, and chlorine. Sodium is actually a metal. Uh, it, uh, those of you that uh, have been in the military, they used to have something called willy peat. Uh, white phosphorus, um, and then they changed it to more of a sodium color. But sodium, on its own, it will it will catch fire. And then chlorine is a deadly gas. Uh, they, we used to chlorinate our water in a. Uh, I, I worked at a. I had the opportunity to work in a sewage treatment plant when right? I got out of high school and while I was in college, uh, that was fun. Um, and uh, we used to have a, the chlorine room, which had this big heavy door. And uh, I'd have to go in there and check the gauges and everything. And, of course, the guys that I worked with, they're like some of you, uh, and they would stand outside and go, oh, no, the door is shutting. And, you know, and, of course, I'd freak out and run out of the building. Uh, but, uh, but, see, without sodium chloride, neither animals, humans, or, or even much of what we have industrially as manufactured goods, would, we would not be able to have. No life, no goods. Uh, salt is something, which is what sodium chloride is. Salt is called, it's hygro, hygroscopic. It means it attracts water. And, and to make sure that, you know, what you put on your food at the table, to make sure that stuff actually stays granular, and will pour, uh, they add some things to it. They tell us this is perfectly reasonable, and when we get to heaven, God will tell us it's probably killing us. Who knows? Um, but they add something called aluminosilicate, uh, TSP, which is called trisodium phosphate. Uh, I don't know if they can, do you, do you still use trisodium phosphate to clean things down here? Uh, when I was working for Glidden Paint back in the 
70s, we used to sell TSP in these little boxes and you'd add it to water and you'd wash down houses and it would strip off the old paint. So anyway, but they use it in very small quantities. TSP, magnos magnesium silicate, and, and all of this is added so that we can actually shake out salt. And, and much of what we buy today, it's called iodized salt because they add potassium iodine, which by the way, helps you from getting gout or goiter rather. And goiter is uh, the swelling of your thyroid. Mm. I've seen pictures of that. Uh, it's, it's very unpleasant looking. We don't have it much anymore, not in this part of the world anyway. Um, there are parts of the world that still, most of this is like even sub-Saharan Africa, where the scarcity of salt uh, makes it extremely costly to have, and only the, it's only available to the wealthiest of the people in those parts of the world. In Scripture, we see the commands of God requiring that salt be added to the sacrifices. It has for millennia been a symbol of, of preservation and purity. And in Scripture, especially in the Levitical sacrificial system, it was an aspect of holiness. It was also costly. Because if you're going to truly sacrifice something, it should cost you something. In Scripture, salt is a picture of peace, of, of commitment, purity, and even the experiences that we have in our relationship with God. Under the Levitical system, the, the addition of salt, uh, it, it confirmed our commitment, or the people's commitment at that time. It confirmed the commitment to the covenant of God and His peace, where God Himself provides. But by the time we get to the end of the Old Testament, especially in the book of Malachi, God himself accuses the priests of offering like the lame and the blind as sacrifices, not the best of their that they can, but the worst. And it completely lacks anything resembling holiness. And I'm certain that they didn't add salt. In Mark chapter 9, Verses 38 to 50, Mark describes the Apostle John uh, perhaps attempting to recoup uh, some standing with Jesus. And John was describing to Jesus how they tried to stop someone casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Now, the response that Jesus gave was not probably what John was expecting. All of those who recognized Jesus and who accomplished the work of the Father in his name belonged to him. What the disciples had yet to realize was common experiences are shared in common by all people. All will be salted with fire, both the saved and the lost. Yet those who belong to Jesus, we have different responsibilities from the rest of humanity. Follow along as we read this short passage in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 50. John said to them, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, said Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the uncrenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. 
Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will they make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. In verses 38 to 50, there's one point. Because you belong to Christ. That's why. I, I remember as a child, I, I was, uh, we had neighbors across the street. They were literally the neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the, the kids over there, we, my brother and I were friends with him. And I remember we were involved in some things that my dad did not approve of, and of course my dad make it, made it very obvious that he was not approving of them, uh, to the point where neither my brother and I were able to talk afterwards. Um, and uh, I, I remember telling him, well, we, you know, we were over there with, with our friends, and you know, we were doing uh, these things, and he said, I don't care, you belong to me. They don't. Okay, and considering what Dad had just shared with my brother and I, uh, you know, by the, I've told you before, when I heard that 36-inch belt come through the loops of his Levi jeans, fear fell on my life. And because of what he just shared, my father proved that we belonged to him. Even the writer, uh, I believe the writer of Hebrews says this, because if you're not disciplined, if you do not receive the discipline of God, then perhaps you don't belong to him. In fact, he goes, he says it even more strongly. He says, you don't. Many commentaries provide possible motives for John's statement here to Jesus. Um, Because Mark opens verse 38, relating the apostles John's statement Uh, regarding someone outside of the 12 who was casting out demons in your name. Now, given the context, John may well have been trying to recover, uh, you know, some of the standing for the 12, because remember, uh, Jesus addressed them pretty strongly because what were they talking about? Which one of them was the greatest? And it's important, though, for us to realize this could be the reason, but God did not direct Mark to plainly inform us of John's motives. Yet, because Mark was writing under the spirit of inspiration, uh, we have the ability to learn through the instruction preserved here in, in Mark's gospel. So let's do a quick review before we see what Jesus said to John in verses 39 and 41. When Peter, James, John came down the mountain with Jesus, After the transfiguration, they found the remaining nine disciples, they were embroiled in an argument with scribes from Jerusalem. Why? Well, because, remember, they could not cast out a demon from the Son of the Father in verses 14 to 29. They could not cast out the demon. Perhaps part of the reason God chose Mark to write this gospel is Mark's ability to to tell a story that presents irony in the actions of the disciples. The disciples themselves could not cast out a demon in the boy. While no mention of the exact method they chose to follow is is there, Jesus makes it plain in verse 29 of chapter 9 that that could only be accomplished through much prayer. Did they pray? Probably not, given the context. See, prayer is a key aspect of the believer in Jesus Christ. Um, We will see in a few moments the importance of of salt as a preservative and as a symbol of peace and commitment and holiness and even the covenant in our sacrifices. And remember, we today, we're under the new covenant. We lift up a sacrifice of praise through prayer. Yet prayer is more integral to our lives than salt, but in Scripture, in many of the contexts, salt can also represent the necessity of prayer. Much prayer is also a statement of dependence on God. The disciples could not cast out a demon because maybe they thought it was just an act, you know, just like a lucky rabbit's foot. Uh, I, I, as a pastor, 
uh, I, uh, I still, I, I still on occasion, I will meet people and I'll ask them, well, well, when do you guys go to church? Where do you go? Oh, we go to that church over there by, by you know, where, do you know where Van Zandt Lawnmower is? I said, I got an idea. I said, well, well, we go to church there. Really? Yeah, yeah, do you know? And they name people that I have no idea who these people are. Okay, now I've been here 10 and a half years now. And, and even when I, I think the latest conversation with somebody like this was probably, you know, it's been within the past six months. And, uh, you know, and I'm sitting there, okay, I got 10 years in this job. I don't know these people. I don't have a lot of people here. So it's pretty easy for me to name everybody that's on the rolls. And I don't know who you're talking about. And so, you know, they're telling me that they, they come here. They haven't been here in 25 years. You know? And so, you know, Do they really depend on God? Do they really show, demonstrate that they depend on God? The disciples could not cast out a demon because maybe they just thought it was just an act. See, people, people sometimes they think that just because they're a member somewhere, well, then they're always a member. You know, we're always a member there, and they treat it like a lucky rabbit's foot. You know, I can remember people used to show me in their Bibles. Uh, of course, nobody ever, I, you know, remember when people used to write their, their, their baptism date in their Bibles? Nobody ever writes their baptism date on their iPad. I mean, think about it. A lot of people, you, they, they, I think it's perfectly fine. Francis and I were talking about this on the way in this morning. Uh, I, why do I use a Bible and not an iPad? Number one, it's a symbol of God's authority. And I'm the pastor dude, and I think I should do that. Number two... I never have to worry about my battery going down in my Bible. If the battery goes down on your iPad, you can just look over on somebody else. If the battery goes down on my iPad, I don't have anybody else to look on. It's me. So I like having a, a physical Bible. But, but the problem is, is that the people, they have these, these lucky rabbit's foots. And look, foots, feet. Oh, that's going to look good on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be fine. That's okay. Uh, and, and so they've got these little, you know, and, and if you think about it, that rabbit foot wasn't very lucky for that rabbit because he ain't got it anymore. And so, uh, you know, he, it's, I never understood those. It's, look at my lucky rabbit's foot. Lucky for who? You know, and so... Never. It's like the it's like the Braille menu that they that they put the sign that they put on the wall at McDonald's. Braille menus available. Who's that sign for? The guy that needs a Braille menu can't see it. Just a thought. I think about these things. Be afraid. Um, and so the disciples they couldn't cast out. And why? Perhaps they thought it was just an act. It was just something that they could do. They could just say the words. You see that a lot of times on TV when, when they have, I, I still see shows or something where somebody says grace. Who are you talking to? What's it mean? Yet here in verses 38 to 41, John is telling Jesus perhaps of a show of their great wisdom or you know, perhaps not. How did they stop someone who was casting out demons because they weren't on the team? Because they weren't doing it the way that they did it. You know, I'm hearing more and more, and these are good men overall, you know. They want to talk about all the other pastors and churches that aren't doing it the right way. Look, I... I there, there's a bunch of church. You, we could talk about that for weeks, months. I have a very limited amount of time. I have to teach you what this says. And then if I teach you what this says, and if I do a, a decent job aided by the Holy Spirit, then you can figure out what the other people are doing wrong. That's what my hope is. And Jesus, perhaps very gently or... Maybe not. I mean, sometimes we, we read the Bible and we think it says, do not stop them. What if Jesus didn't actually talk that way? What if Jesus just, just looked at him and says, do not stop him? You know, like Jesus was incredulous. Do not stop him. Why? 
No one who does a mighty or a powerful, that's what the word mighty there means. It's, it's where we get our word dynamite, dunamis. No one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who is not against us is for us. That's what it says in verses 39 to 40. What is Jesus telling John? I mean, really. He told them that there are other people who believe in me other than just you 12 people. In verse 41, Jesus is telling the disciples that those who help those who belong to him, because they also belong to him, will by no means lose their reward. I find it interesting there. If you look at that verse, it says, uh, verse 41, For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ. He doesn't say me. He doesn't mention the word, his name, Jesus. He doesn't say son of man. He uses the word Messiah. Because you belong to Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one. And the only way you can acknowledge that somebody belongs to the Messiah or the promised one is you have to recognize who he is. He says, they by no means lose their reward. And it is here where it may seem that Jesus radically changes the subjects. Is he once again speaking of children? Is this who these little ones who believe in me means? Now we have to review what Jesus was communicating. Now remember, that little child was probably still somewhere near where he said it. And if it was a toddler, probably not. You know, they, they tend to move rather frequently. Um, and, and, uh, but, but it's still, he set that little child in the midst of them. And, and, and in their midst, to speak about receiving one such child in my name receives me. Now, what we can readily grasp from the context back in verses 36 to 37, Jesus is not merely referring only to children. How? First, he immediately states, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So he's not talking just about children. He's setting up a parallel. He's setting up a comparison and a contrast here. We then secondly may understand in the parallel that John, that Jesus has just signaled to his listeners that he is using the one such child also represents much more than just children, but any who are immature, any who need guidance, and any who are in need of protection. So then, now we are back to what Jesus is saying in verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones, and remember, there are no indicators in this passage and in this text that Jesus has suspended his comparison or his parallel. So whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Okay, no matter uh, how you interpret the emotional impact of the picture of these words, this is really bad. This is a very, very bad thing. The only thing worse than that kind of death, drowning, would be burning. Which, by the way, is in the context. We know by the established parallels that Jesus has made whoever causes another immature believer who should be receiving protection to sin, the most horrible death imaginable is, is better by comparison to the punishment to be received for causing such a one to sin through whatever action is imaginable. And why is Jesus setting this up? Because drowning is pretty bad. Burning is a lot worse. And it's not like you burn, you die in hell. You burn forever. In verses 43 to 47, now I, I want you to notice, now in, in the text that I have, uh, that I put up here is with the ESV, the English Standard Version. And notice that there is no verse 44, 
nor is there a verse 46. It is not because that the people that wrote the ESV and translated it, they hate the King James, and, and they're trying to remove God from the Bible. That, uh, don't listen to the people that post such nonsense on Facebook. Okay, that is not why it's there. Okay, the reason is, is that even conservative scholars, as well as reliable manuscripts, show that these two verses, verses 44 and 46, were scribal additions made by the copyists. They didn't have Xerox machines, no printers, no printing press, just some guy in a room writing, copying. That was it. And so a copyist probably thought, you know, this would sound a lot better if we put, you know, verses 44 and 40, 46 in here. Verses 44 and 46, they merely repeat verse 48 verbatim, word for word. Look at verse 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, I have heard this verse all of my life when talking about hell. But usually it says this, and I purposely said it fast so there would be a misunderstanding. It says, where their worm, it doesn't say where the worm. It says where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The seriousness is also communicated with the inclusion in this description. Hell is a real place, being separated from everyone and God, and, and you're, you're separated from everybody else, you're separated from God, and, and suffering is beyond our ability to understand or imagine. It, it is so bad, even the worst possible description of death on this world doesn't even compare. See, Jesus in the previous passage, keep in mind, he's doing parallels. He's giving us examples. He is not advocating self-immolation. In other words, for us to, to damage ourselves in order to prove how, how sorry we are. Uh, they used to have, uh, in the Middle Ages, back when the uh, Black Plague was going on, and a third of the population at that time died. That would be like over a hundred and. 17, 18 million people in the United States dying. Okay? 170, that makes, that makes COVID 118 times worse. I don't even know if we made it to a million yet in deaths, but it could be by now. Of course, no. If Google doesn't block me for this, uh, it, 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 almost everything's COVID-related anymore, but still... Um, 118 million of our population would have to die to equal how many people died in Europe during the Black Plague. They used to have these people called flagellants. And they were these men that they would walk from village to village and they would have whips with basic, you know, pieces of metal and stone in them and stuff. And they would, they would flail their own backs in an attempt to lessen the disease that was in those particular cities and everybody welcomed them because they were suffering so much it doesn't do any good if you're an impure sacrifice god's not going to accept you you have to be completely pure for the sacrifice to be accepted it is incapable we are incapable of doing that on our own Jesus is not, you know, he's not saying literally cut off your, your hand or your foot or your eye. It, it, sin is a product of a fallen soul, of a fallen uh, psyche or thought process. Jesus knew this. Sin does not reside in your hand or in your eye or in your foot or in any other part of your body. It is endemic. It is residing throughout who you are. There's no part of us that is affected by sin. We must take sin seriously. God took sin so seriously that he gave his son to die for us in our place. And so we must look long and hard and consider the payment that God the Father made through the life of his son Christ 
who suffered an unimaginably cruel death on the cross for me and for you. In verse 49, for our ability to understand of all the connections that Jesus is trying to make here, this is perhaps the place where it's the most difficult. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now, is he now speaking of the lost? Of those who will suffer in the fires of hell? Look, look at verse 49. For everyone will be salted with fire. Jesus took the time to speak as clearly as possible, and he used the inclusive word, everyone. Why? Well, everyone applies to uh, everyone. Everyone will die. Short of Jesus Christ coming back for the church, everyone will die. Everyone will face great difficulty. Not the same difficulty, but everyone will face varying degrees of difficulty. The believer who chooses to take his sin seriously and make radical changes in his life, uh, you know, which might be similar sometimes to some people think that he removed his hand or his foot or his eye. I know believers that they, they, they won't use a computer at home because they can't trust themselves with what they're going to look at. If you make your living doing that, that's going to be kind of tough. And so you've got to figure out a way around this. But see, we don't have to figure it out on our own. We've got God. It's called prayer. Do we actually believe that God is going to answer our prayer when we ask him to help us remove the sin in our life and allow us to live more holy life? Do you think he's going to look at us and go, nah, nah man, I'm going to let you squirm? No. If we're asking for what he wants, he will give it because it's in his character. It's in his name. You're going to be salted with fire. Yet, not to the degree of the one who is guilty due to the lack of convicting power of the Holy Spirit in their life and is guilty of causing others to sin and sins against them, they will experience a torture in eternal hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now note this, I mentioned earlier, it is not the worm, it's their worm. It is not a place where the worm does not die, but where their worm does not die. You know, I found, and this is what was so helpful about commentaries, I have found no commentary that mentions anything about this. Not one, not one. I went to, I, I, I stopped at 14. I couldn't find anybody making any comment on this. Either they thought that this had no, no theological significance, which is, okay, fine, maybe. But, you know, inquiring minds want to know. Nothing. So where do I go? Well, I pray, and then I go back to the context. Contextually, this is also found in Isaiah 66, 24, which gives us a picture of the worms which consume flesh. <laughs> the word hell here is Gehenna, a reference to the Valley of Hinnom, which is a dumping area for sewage and garbage and all things rotten, and the way they handle it, they set it on fire. And for those of you that's never camped or never been out in the woods, a lot of times campers, they will find animal dung, and guess what? It burns. All dung does. And so these worms which consume flesh and never die. Hell then is to be as graphically clear as possible. It is eternal death and decomposition since those who are there are removed from the only one who gives and sustains life. He gives and takes away, is what that first song said, remember? He gives and takes away. But if you are apart from God, God will neither, neither give you anything. Guess what? He will not also take stuff away. So that that continuous situation of painful burning, which brings no death, decomposition 
is that how it's actually going to be? I mean, literally, are people going to be filled with worms and eaten by them? And if it, It's a picture. Jesus wants to make it as clear as possible, to be as revolting as possible. There's no reason why it couldn't be. But we can, I, can be, I can say this dogmatically. It's horrible beyond our imagination. Let's make sure we're not going there. Jesus closes in verse 50 stating, Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? If salt is necessary for life, if we as believers are to be literal and spiritual salt and light in this dark world, and if we lose our salty Savior, the property of salt, which are to flavor and to cleanse and to preserve, as well, keep in mind, for the believer, as to remind the believer of the holiness of our sacrifice and life before God, how can this be fixed, and how can we be made salty again? How? The answer? We cannot. If we, have, if we have within us the ability to lose our Savior, now this is if, if we have the ability within us to lose our Savior, our saltiness, it is because we were never truly salt to begin with. Because God is the one that saves us. God is the one that calls us. God calls those whom he knows are his. My sheep hear my voice, is what Jesus says. I realize that this is what the Bible teaches. It can be uncomfortable. If you have heard God's voice, you're his. Otherwise, guess what? You wouldn't have. We were never truly pure salt if we could do this. Uh, salt at that time, the, like at the edges of the Dead Sea, due to evaporation, these salts would wash up on the shore, and it would be salty for a time because it had so much impurities mixed in with it. But it was not pure salt. It was not purely sodium chloride. And so those people that have lost their saltiness, they were never pure salt. They just managed to pick up a few things that make them look that way. Maybe even make them taste that way. I don't know. See, and once someone rejects who Christ is, then this is where the words in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, actually come to life and actually give meaning. Look at this on the screen. For it is impossible... In the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. And if you want to take out the, the parenthetical in that whole thing, it, it reads this, for it is impossible to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. The only way that applies is if you've never been saved. You cannot lose your salvation because you did nothing to get it. God cho chose you. You didn't choose him. You were unaware of him until he called you. So, Jesus concludes by coming all the way around and back to where he began as he questions his disciples in verse 33 when they were arguing about who was the greatest Jesus commanded them to have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Why? Because they belong to Jesus just as we do. As do all who profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, we, we have to act different. We have to seek different things, be motivated differently. And we must be different. 
the way we look at the world, the way we experience the world. And it's, it, it's not like, you know, healthy, healthy things grow, healthy trees grow. In fact, healthy fruit trees produce fruit. Uh, back when I was younger, I actually found this, uh, I don't know how many years ago, I was dig- digging through my, my, my files. I, I, <laughs> I taught a sermon at my first church. I called it Grunting Trees. That was about the only really interesting thing about that whole thing. <laughs> so, but I was trying to be catch people's attention. They got their attention, all right. Uh, just imagine every teenage boy that was in the service that day, and there was a good number of them. Uh, just play with that for a second and think where that went. Um, but I was talking. But, but my 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 scripture was is you know that you know that the the producing the fruit of the spirit. If it's a healthy fruit tree, it's going to grow fruit. If it's not healthy, it will not. We have to act differently, be motivated differently. We must be different. That means we don't have to try to be different. We are different. We think differently. We see the world differently because we know someone who made us different. We are not of this world. We are to be salt in life to it. Everyone will be salted with fire. Everyone will live forever somewhere. How we live will demonstrate where we will be eternally. Let us live like Paul lived and desire to have our desires crucified with Christ. Let's stand and pray. Father, you take your word as only you can, and you apply it to our lives. You give us the ability to understand what you have for us and how you are going to make us into the people that we need to be. Father, I just ask that you would grant us this ability. Grant us the desire to ask you for it more than anything. Father, we, we're human, and you know us. You know what we are. You know that we're just like the dust in this world. We are so easily swept up in the winds of change. But, Father, you give us weight, mass, heaviness. In fact, In the Old Testament, that's what holiness actually meant. Weightiness, heaviness. You you give us that so that we will be unaffected by what happens in this world. And we're unaffected not because we're special, not because we've made choices, but because you have made choices and you have chosen us. You give us that that ability, Father. Father, there could be people here that they're struggling with so many things. It could be in their families. It could be at their jobs. It could just be just they're fretting about what's going on in our world. It can be bad. It is bad. Your word tells us that it will get worse. But you do not change. And you've promised to take care of us. So, Father, may we cast all of our cares upon you, and may we understand that you're in control. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home. Come Jesus 
is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not His mercy? Mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. May God bless you. Thank you for coming.